Welcome back to High Performance Computing. Um, today we have our lecture three about parallelization fundamentals. And this is part two of this lecture. In the first part of the lecture, we really thought about very fundamental aspects of high performance computing. And this is really to think about a so-called term domain decomposition. If you want to simulate something, um, a race car, or if you want to do, let's say, numerical weather prediction of the Earth, climate predictions, you always have a very tough computational problem, um, which cannot be solved by using just a laptop. So in the end, you end up of chopping up the domain, of cutting the domain into different pieces in order to enable parallelism. We looked at some simple in ideas of doing this, of course, with an array, and then basically in the array, you want to have the maximum value. Uh, things which maybe perhaps you don't want to really use HPC for uh, if it's especially just on full course, but it captures the essence of the large picture of parallelization. Think about divide and conquer. You're always stronger dividing this big problem into different smaller pieces, having it solved in parallel where possible, and then report back. And when you think about the parallelization fundamentals, <clears throat> that's all what it entails, and it could be having data parallelism or functional parallelism, where you break the domain into different pieces. Um, we have seen functional parallelism makes sense maybe when you have different model types, even interacting with the ocean model or the atmosphere model to really have reality in terms of what rain would mean to the ocean and et cetera. Um, and data parallelism is perhaps one often used ideas, um, which basically captures also then the term of thinking about the single program really that we know already from MPI in lecture two, but then also, you know, basically of the SPMD multiple data. So you would do the same program, but for multiple data in all this chopped out different domain parts. And of course, it's, it's a very conceptual lecture. So we start here really high level, breaking it down but motivating with this a little bit why we want to do high performance computing in the end. We want to have a real, the, the most real simulation we want to have of this particular domain we represent. And this could be, as we have seen in the video from Barcelona Supercomputing Center, excellently um, in, in all sorts of different domain from duct discovery up to basically you have seen the volcano with Ayafetia Yukul you have seen basically ideas of the heart simulations with all its different compartments. So basically, this is our motivation. We have a engineering or a scientific problem. It's too large to solve on a normal laptop. So we have to chunk it down. We have to have, you know, cut it into different pieces really, but then still do communication between all these different pieces in order to solve a bigger problem. Solve a problem in a cooperative way nails it down to say why we do parallelization and the first part was really all about it and we learned basically here and there some some interesting examples also that the world is not always flat and shiny we learned that of course having interesting meshes around real problems like the airbus right we're interested in the turbines basically the 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 stress on the materials directly at the race car not maybe something which is, let's say, one or two meters away from it. We want to have the stress on the material in terms of pressure, depending on the speed of the race car and things like that directly at the race car. So we would have maybe not a Cartesian structure or a more, let's say, grid structure, but more an interesting, let's say, domain decomposition, which is maybe even dynamic. And we will learn this in adaptive mesh refinement strategies um, very later in the course. But this is really one of the fundamental aspects of the course here. Um, needless to say that this would be one of the first lectures to talk about. But based on our students' feedback and our YouTube feedback, we already incorporated some practical examples and MPI programming very early in the course to have time enough for the assignments. That's why basically MPI came a little bit first. But now with the parallelization ideas and fundamentals, you really get more and more this, the idea behind why we need this message exchange versus MPI, why we need in every time step, the information of the previous time step, why we have to communicate this, because not all of us can basically program shared memory in a very little, little space. 
the idea of shared memory is very limited. It's powerful because memory is very, you know, performance is, is directly accessible, but it's very limited. If you want to have lots of lots of nodes, lots of lots of basically HPC, um, different, uh, you know, scalability enabled, going up to 1,000, 10,000, 100,000 cores and more, um, then you basically would think about different strategies. And this is only enabled by not directly accessing the memory space, but by sending messages. And this is exactly what MPI entails with the point-to-point -point communication with the collectives uh, in order to basically access the memory of all others. And the application scenarios that we will have uh, based on lecture 10 until the end of this course will be giving much more insights on this. But before we come to this, we really have to learn some basics. And this is what's also part two of this lecture will reveal. Um, we have to talk about some terms and some actually theoretical insights that makes you understand parallelization from a different perspective, because it always sounds nice of thinking, well, basically, you just divide by two by having two processes instead of one, and basically divide by four if you have four, and you know, you go on with a number of cores, but the reality is that at some point in time, laws kick in, which makes you basically realize that the scalability is not endlessly and that basically parallelization has limits we will have to talk about in the second part. So the theoretical aspects of it would be you know, alluding to some things like speed up and will be still not so theoretical that, you know, put away the lecture and think it's too much math. We keep it to a moderate degree here as a six credit course. But please sit fast your seatbelt because it will be an interesting lecture with some formulas. But the formulas will be still, uh, I think, really reasonable and actually also easy to understand. <clears throat> so again, parallelization, high performance computing, think about it, right? Now we, we have some motivation in part one, and this is basically reviewing this a little bit in order to understand which materials I should put in a train um, that you see here, these gentlemen actually think about the design of the new trains in a kind of virtual environment and then fueled by HPC simulations, you would think you can burn a train a hundred times. It doesn't cost anything. It's just computing power. It costs a bit energy, yes, but still it's probably less expensive than burning real hundred trains in physical space. So you would put it to virtual reality, put it to HPC systems in order to find out what would be the best material maybe for the seats in order to prevent that, you know, fire will be quickly coming to the strains and so on and save life. So with this, um, it is really an essential tool. You can do experiments that you otherwise cannot do because they're too life threatening, they're too costly. And of course, parallelization is then the key because you want to have this, of course, on a better and better accuracy. You want to have better granularity of the space. The train should be to real detail. The weather prediction basically should be improving, you know, from, from regions really to really small households and maybe, you know, your neighborhood. So this is something we strive for. The new challenges, making it even more real, making it basically more precise and accurate. And with this, HPC enables this by putting, of course, more computing to the rescue. But um, this lecture will also realize you uh, or will realize some some certain limits that this is not so easy as we think. It's not always chop it down into equal spaces and put the course to it. There are much more to the, to the equation. Also, if you think about the computing is always granted, people in the community sometimes when we talk with application scientists, they think, well, computing is just, you know, improving all the time. You see that here quite nicely. Think about the 70s up to 2020 with AMD and so on. So actually we had this Moore's law and that was always nice to say that the number of transistors uh, basically is every two years increased and doubles and you know computing can be for granted to be increased. But we have also seen that without this you know, idea of accelerators, this would be probably not completely true anymore. And um, this is something what we see on this particular video part. I just reference it here again um, because we had it in the first part where basically we had the second 
um, part of TensorFlows, but here we emphasize on the first part of the Moore's Law. Predicting the Earth's most severe weather. Finally finding a cure for cancer. And developing more meaningful interactions with technology. These are some of the world's next great challenges, and solving them will require exponential growth in computing power. But the gap between CPU performance and the performance that Moore's Law promises continues to widen. There was a need for a new... <clears throat> That's basically where we're at, right? So we see that because of this high single thread performance of CPUs, they get incredibly hot. So the clock speed within each of the CPUs cannot be more increased um, in order to achieve this, let's say, nice um, scaling of the Moore's Law. However, we see extremely amount of processes we can put in for moderate performance in the GPUs. You see that a little bit approach. here. GPU accelerated. Which, which is a bit, let's say, cheating in the sense that, of course, you have much more of those now suddenly available than it was in the multi-core processor. You have this many-core processor, and with this, um, basically, in a, in a possibility to maybe not really have a high single thread performance, and each one of those just moderate performance, but just employ thousands of them. And with this, um, you, you basically get the story that essentially the parallelization is won by, by really leveraging the amount of work that you can pull off to different processes. And of course, it has still their, their meaning that multi-core processes are around because because of the high signal street performance, they are number crunches. They can really solve problems really fast. But if you have a problem that scales very well, that can be chopped down into different pieces with simple computation, like we have seen in the matrix multiplication or matrix vector multiplication before, this is just beautiful for GPUs to scale out. And uh, as a consequence, then, if you think about um, when you want to have two motivations really to do parallelization, you would say, firstly, maybe a single core is, is actually not really, um, it's just too slow to solve the problem, right? Think about the train burning, for instance, or numerical weather prediction. We would be nowhere if the single core would be involved. And the second point is perhaps best explained in, in the earth sciences or maybe even in, in kind of health sciences, the available memory on the single system is not sufficient. So in order to represent the Earth in a, in a single space, it's just such amount of data. And if you want to do it more and more realis realistically and, and do it then basically that it really is a realistic representation of the Earth, you will find that you need more and more memory to have this mem this variables that actually represent all of this reality. And with this come also to some problems. So you have actually, either it is too slow for a normal laptop, or you would say the memory of a small laptop is not good enough. So basically we will move to HPC in order to have these two problems solved. But this doesn't mean yet that you have your parallelization method. So then this is just your motivation for going into parallel. You want to speed up things. You want to basically have a better representation of the simulation, let's say um, the, the weather prediction. And with this, you then have to think about what parallelization methods you entail. <clears throat> so, but it captures the essence why you want to do this in the end, which is one of the goals really, what you can call a speed up. So everybody knows in the HPC domain what a speed up entails. So speed up is one term that you really know by heart, also for the exam, that would be very important. But here's a very simple, trivial example where you would have the initial work you have to do uh, being here in this kind of 12 time steps to do some work. And it really doesn't matter what work it is right now uh, in, the, in a way, it just shows you the essence. If you divide it by three workers, these work that is basically done then you can basically solve this problem in, in a very little time. Of course, this is a bit saying that, that the previous time step is not really depending on the results of the previous uh, work, right? So that the next time step is not depending on the previous time steps that you really can cut it like that. 
But here you have, instead of one worker doing this, we have three workers doing it. So you have this T12 time steps that you could use in order to cut it with three workers as n equal three, so let's say three processes, and you have just four time steps in terms of 12. And this captures the essence of the so-called speed up term. We want to be faster. We want to be having a lower time to solution. And by employing more and more workers, uh, you would think speed up is of course very easy. You just you know employ more and more CPUs and cores and then you just scale up your problem. But of course, you have to program all of that. And then, of course, there are some interesting surprises that we will learn later that there's some, some problem of doing this. And one of the problems is really of achieving a good load um, balance. So the load imbalance is really a problematic part where you think you have cut down the problem into three different processors that all are happily working on these different tasks. But remember that maybe some of the tasks are having not always the equal share of data. The physical processes might be very trivial. So here you have a, a domain and maybe here in number six is really computed very quickly. So maybe there were no clouds to interact with a bright sky while the others have to fight with clouds, no matter what it is. But it could mean that the tasks, of course, are differently executed. And then in order to wait to solve the overall problem, you basically have some unused resources here. And these unused resources are very loaded. We, was, we basically say that we reserved the computing for you, all the three cores or the three processes here to do the work, but you don't use them. So we call that an underutilized resource. So basically um, you take it away from others and administrators will have a look on this. They will actually know and will see the people that actually always reserve a lot of computing time and then don't use it. And this underutilization is, of course, a key problem because you share the HPC machine with many different users. Hence, this load imbalance is kind of hampering the performance for different reasons. And one of it is, of course, because the resources are underutilized, but also maybe, you know, some of the parts of the application, like for is basically taking a long time while those are already waiting a long time to be finished. So maybe a different domain decomposition here would have made a difference. But in order to capture the difference, to understand how I cut this into different pieces, I need to have experiments. I have to need to basically run these applications different times. And here you see a very good example of this load imbalance problem, right? You see here a typical we would call that maybe master work a paradigm rank zero takes a special rank um, of basically distributing the resources, communicating with everyone. Um, if you zoom down into details, you see different MPI operations in order to really send, receive, and then so on. But the key message to take away is that although all the ranks, <clears throat> think about it, here's like 30 something, right? So all these rank compute and take these HPC resources, but they all wait basically for the rank zero to finish. So the overall MPI runtime is indeed 38 seconds here, while the most of these resources actually have been already finished with after 20 seconds. So you come to a situation which abstracted away a bit, looks like this. You have one of the ranks, which might be in this node, you have already learned in our practical lecture, that of course, different processors can be residing in one node. So here might be rank zero and rank one, rank two, or rank three, etc., depending on what multi-core machine it is. But it doesn't matter here, just to realize that this node is very active by computing this, while all of these are blocked from different users to take. So that's your job doing nothing. And hence, load imbalance is a problem. And, and here, basically, there are lots of different tools like performance analysis tools that we will learn in later lecture to actually engage in this parallel performance issues. That's what you don't want to have on a HPC machine. You want to have a load balance so that each of the different cores or even the memory, it doesn't necessarily is a core. If the memory is completely used, it could be a reason for that, that not all cores are computed. Um, but basically, here we have to to see really the cost and the, the, the side effects and 
basically of doing this and, and what you do in terms of communication, for instance, because here we have a typical master worker communication scenario that this rank zero is just in charge of all the different communication to all these processes, probably collecting all the results of these processes, which takes him a lot of time. So maybe here decentralize it a bit would help um, in order to engage in this problem. But it gives you a sensitivity of this load imbalance problem that you see right here. And then another parallelization challenge really is what domain decomposition should I choose? And I think this one here is a very good example because everybody thinks always in terms of, you know, chopping everything up in blocks or if you're into D, why not just doing a Cartesian over it, uh, basically grid-like fashion of domain decomposition and then cut it into different processor spaces. And this is an example where from the computing perspective and the from the physics perspective, which underlies this example, where you think differently. And basically, this is a smart domain decomposition because it makes sense in the domain it represents. And you see here an n-body simulation, which basically is, is a term of saying the interaction of n-bodies. And here is an example of particles. So we want to know what the interaction is of this red particle with many of the particles in the space. And this could be for different scenarios in, in astrophysics uh, simulations. I was doing this personally. And there are different spaces where you basically think about particles, where a particle could be, let's say, a representation of the stars, could be different meanings. Here is basically a, a, a laser um, idea of a so-called future therapy for cancer, which basically heats up this particular part. In a way, it doesn't really matter, but it means that the interaction of these particles play a role. And the industry, uh, part of it is really then, instead of computing everything in detail here, what you would suggest, and then make a Cartesian over it and do it in small different pieces, you're not really interested in the particle interaction here. You want to compute these particles because they're very close to the red one I'm interested in, very detailed. But when it comes to the next scale of saying long range interactions, right? So the particles that are long gone here, maybe because they're so long range to my red particle of interest, it's not maybe necessary to, to actually compute the interaction intensively four times with this particle because it's so far away. So I'm getting to a more tree-based structures where you basically think about here, the domain decomposition is in terms of space away from a particle. It's represented as a tree thinking about that the interaction of these four particles can be considered as one maybe because they are close to each other and they are closer to each other. So instead of computing it with every single one of them, we can enverge basically it as a one single particle more or less to save computational time to be more performant. And although we will have this in later lectures in more detail and so on, just it, it basically stimulates hopefully that a domain decomposition is not always blocky, uh, being a rectangle and always being a beautiful Cartesian. You always have to put some smart thinking into it. What actually would be the best domain decomposition that you can do for your specific problems? And <clears throat> there are other scalability impacts. So I talked about you, you know, just throwing more cores on it. It will solve the problem and here's a very good example admittedly with an older machine blue gene q which is not anymore there but associate that you know in order to solve a problem just use the whole machine you know and, and where's the problem so the problem entails that these machines have of course a network interconnection they have um, processors interconnected with this network and it's basically the ability of the whole system in a way to, to cope with the growing amount of work. And with this, you basically have basically not the perfect speed up you would think of. It maybe work well when you throw two cores to the problem and four cores and eight cores, 16 cores. Usually a researcher in this um, you know, field would always do a, two, a power of two in the beginning of always increasing to the power of two the amounts of cores. It will scale very nicely, but at some point in time, 
you hit the machine limits where you would say there's a network interconnect node that actually distributes then all this information you have via EMPI. So um, in the end, I'm saying that the domain decomposition is one factor to get high performance, but you have to know your system basically and to scale well with this system to use all the available memory and then to use the node interconnects very well is not as simple as it sounds. So it's not just always throwing more cores and you have a very nice linear speed up as we call that. And I will elaborate on this term basically in, in the next couple of slides, but just take away the message that parallelization seems sometimes so much easy, but people forget that there are always some elements to it which are not really scalable. Um, and we will talk about it now. And now speed up still is, is of course a term you really need to take out of this course. So increasing the course, let's say two instead of one, 50% improved, perfect. Um, as I said earlier, it's not the game, especially if you scale up higher. Um, you always change the number of cores. You see that nicely in one of our um, clustering algorithms here from one of my PhD students who actually graduated already and is now in Helmholtz AI, a leader in Karlsruhe. Um, but the key message to take away is really um, the more cores you put, you would assume a much more speed up there is. So they would, of course, always divide by two, divide by two, divide by two or something as an example. Um, but you see here nicely in the plots, it's not the case. You see a certain tail off, and that's what we call that, a tail off of performance. And for certain reasons, for different reasons, we have strong scaling, weak scaling, I come to later on. But here you see the, the, the very primitive way, it's not a logarithmic scale even, it's a complete normal scale to really show you the, the degradation of performance early on while maybe insignificant in the beginning, but then coming to this tail off. And this is different reasons. And by the way, this different plots here mean something like a different data set one, data set two, and then one hybrid means open MP together with MPI and only MPI here. So there's some certain overheads in the communication because you have suddenly much more number of cores. So the communication overhead is more and, and certain serial limits we will talk about when we talk about Amdahl's law. And so you also have to think about then what means scaling really, right? When I think scaling up the problem, you have certain ways of thinking about it. And, and I think the important part is to think it on two ways because it, it's also reflected in our metrics that we have in the HPC community. You always have this kind of notion of a certain strong scaling. That means you have a total problem size um, that you always keep the same, but you just try to tackle this problem size with increasing the number of processors, right? This is a good example of it. We have the same data set, the same clustering problem, and then just number, of course, actually added here. And sometimes people, of course, don't have this uh, normal, you would say, um, kind of, uh, way how you do this, you have a normal uh, logarithmic scale and so on, but it doesn't matter. The key essence to take away is that the problem size, you have always the same data set, remains the same. So you would think about the strong scaling where the linear scaling is, of course, always the best, right? This is this interesting line that you see on the top here, which is very hard for real applications to actually hit. You can make a good claim you see with hybrid on this data set one, we almost achieve linear scaling until 512 cores. Uh, if we got knows what happens after it, but here you see already when we do MPI or hybrid on the second data set, we have a tail off. So the, it will not follow any more the linear scaling and that's what we are after. Um, but of course it's not easy to achieve. Then the second view on this is of course, and this is now, a smart view and sometimes for my students hard to understand so I spent some Q&A sessions on it to understand it. It's a different metric. Think about now, uh, we call that weak scaling, but think about the room of improvement. So we don't keep the problem size the same. 
But we, we think about if we have more processes, why not using them with more stuff? So this would be the, the, the way to think about it, right? Keeping the work per processor, F3, and creating them the same. And then basically we get in quickly to the limit. So what is possible to do in the domain decomposition? Of course, we want to do this in a way because this enables us to get maybe better simulations, right? We want to have the increased granularity. We have to have increased detail when we chop these domains into different parts. And with this, we have a very good example of saying, um, you know, where are the limits of this weak scaling? And I give you some examples now while we basically first have to, of course, thinking a little bit about how the theoretically is put into um, equations. And here we think about the, um, basically the, the, the time for a fixed problem size. And this is really important factor to understand all of this between strong and weak scaling. You have a fixed problem size here. And this means we have the serial parts and the parallelizable parts. And this will be the whole basically total time to solution for basically a fixed problem size. Now you could think about that the serial parts, I cannot parallelize, this is IO, that is the overhead of MPI preparing the environment for being parallel, but at least a parallelizable part can be done by N parallel workers. So the performance is then basically coming out as this particular formula where you say um, for the fixed problem side, uh, this is strong scaling. And if I can show that it's basically working well and the serial limits are, let's say less, um, this is helping very much. And we can perhaps minimize here the overall time to solution if you want for a certain simulation in HPC. So, and uh, it shows you a little bit the metric of how well a task or a simulation can be paralyzed, apparently, right? Because of course you want to see and have an emphasis on this parallelizable part of the application. And N is something what is in your hand as the HPC guy, right? You you basically not really have limits here. You have a grant, you would submit, you would make the case of saying, I can actually, if I could get this core hours on this particular machine in Europe, um, I can do a much more precise weather prediction. Just give me this N factor, you know, give me more parallel workers, give me more cores. I can actually do a very good simulation and actually can reduce this time to basically solution of all the simulations by, by orders of magnitudes. And, and this is something which is of course very true for the fixed term over the fixed problem size really. And these are examples where you think about the ideal scaling, which is linear here, which many of those will at some point in time tail off. Right, and, and this has this overhead problems of communication. You see here, we already have 256,000 cores on a HPC machine, where we're thinking about that, you know, if you scale up with a relatively scale up, you're very happy, but at some point in time, you reach the limits. And, and this is quite interesting for different parts here of the same, let's say, number of particles in this space that actually compute the interactions. It's a street code I imagine, it's a particular interaction. And the real, let's say specific examples is not so relevant. More important is relevant that basically you understand that by putting more and more of these particles, you see here an increase of the N number um, essentially, and, and essentially this number um, of interactions in the end you will basically need more performance and still it will have a tail off at some point in time. So in a way you have the strong scaling plots saying that for each of these plots, you have still this kind of, um, you know, fixed problem size. You have a very specific that you see here in the N factor specific way of saying uh, at every time step, even if I increase the course, this would be the same problem to solve. Um, and, and this is a strong scaling scenario. So what means weak scaling then? So the weak scaling gives you, let's say the variable size problem. You say with the processors, I increase, I also want to have, let's say the problem or the paralyzable part increasing. 
Um, this is something usually where some students are basically um, ask me again and again, what, what does it mean really? Uh, if there's one word or basically one sentence to put it, you would say you scale the problem size with the amount of processes you have away label. You know, if you have four processes, uh, you jump down Reykjavik uh, and you want to do a weather prediction of Reykjavik into four big blocks. If you have, and basically having a bit grand and saying you have 1,024 processes, as an example, you basically chop down Reykjavik in, in this 20, in, in this 1,024 pieces and then computer physics over all of them. So you basically scale up the problem and can have been a much bigger problem and more detail by having more computing. And this is something where um, exactly this is that it means that the, the domain you represent, the amount of particles you represent is not anymore the same. You would add more detail, add more space maybe. It's not any more Reykjavik, you have more processors, so let's scale it up. And having the surroundings of the Reykjavik, the golden circle and everything included. So in the end, it's a it's a variable size problem, and I think it's best extend if you think about a pair core view, right? And and this is a, the key idea of thinking about big scaling. It says like basically we we had strong scaling already. We know one problem can be cut down into different pieces, but um, basically Gustafsson's law says then. Um, we need just larger problems with more detail to simulate for larger number of CPUs. There are no limits, right? You can always think about, we have a very detailed weather prediction maybe for downtown Reykjavik, and then we extend, we have more cores, more CPUs, then we need a larger problem. So we calculate the weather for whole Reykjavik. And then if you have more CPUs, we say, okay, we have it to the whole Reykjavik Peninsula and Reykjavik and et cetera. So the idea is here of Gustafsson's law is there are no limits and the, the, the kind of amount of work per core can be essentially always increase if you want to have more limits, I mean, explored, if you want to have more detail, if you want to have it to the four garden level, as some people were claiming it, uh, basically in weather prediction where we have to come to, right, that you know the weather in my four garden will be different in my back garden. So this is, of course, the extreme part of it, but thinking about exactly this, that the granularity of this, of course, is a key to understand. And you see this a little bit, um, and, and that's why the weak scaling plots are not really concerned sometimes directly about the speed up. Of course, you think the runtime um, is one factor, but you also think about the efficiency. So is each core really busy if you scale up to two to the 18, in terms of cores, like around 500,000 processes. And you see the efficiency, the parallel efficiency goes down and down, again, the tail off. And, and here the, the point is again thinking about it because it doesn't have to do any more, much more compute if you have maybe 10,000 particles per core. So you keep it busy by saying, okay, if you have so much cores, now we're talking about half a million cores, solving a problem in a cooperative way, roughly, right? So in this sense, you just have to give them more work to do to keep the parallel efficiency and to, to, to make the case why we want to use 500,000 cores and up to a million maybe in the future. And this is the essence of weak scaling. So here, we don't keep the problem constant. You remember strong scaling, keep the problem size fixed, that's not what we do in weak scaling. Here we think about it exactly the opposite. Um, with weak scaling is how the time to solution really changes with all the number of processes uh, for a six problem size, but then per processor. So if we add more processes, right? And this is what we do, right, in HPC. That's our key idea of solving a problem in parallel. Then it gives us lots of perfect, um, you know, insights and, and much more reality maybe, but of course it's also harder to scale and harder to implement so easily. Coming to some laws uh, that stand the test of time, if you want, 
um, which is in the application speed up, the, the so-called Amdahl's law, where we say again, um, basically we have the idea of actually when we have a parallelizable part, which is this one minus S, it means nothing else than the parallelizable part, uh, divided by N could be infinite, right? But but if you scale N towards, let's say, infinite resources that we have now with extra scale, you would even say uh, the amount of processes we can employ to a problem, uh, we have lots of computing capacity, but the problem of Amdahl's law remains in the serial parts, right? There's still some serial, serial parts in the application we cannot do in parallel, and this is a key limit of a HPC application today. So otherwise we would nicely paralyze every single problem. And, and this is Amdahl's law. So having more and more basically cores helps us, but it's not unlimited because basically it's limited in its serial parts. And this is a strong scaling idea and the tail off we have seen here and there. And of course, that for comparison here, Gustafsson's law, which is now the weak scanning part, just says, okay, well, that's not a problem. Then, then let's go just to bigger problems, right? So don't bother anymore with this problem space. Um, think about larger problems um, where basically then there are no limits by the serial part directly, which is weak scaling and where we ensure that each core or the work pair core is really efficient, is really filling the core, is really making a difference. All of this was an introductionary part. So we're still very early in, in the HPC course. And you see it's quite complex material when we talk about parallelization. Hence, the humans usually lose an overview, especially if you come to 500,000 uh, cores, I imagine, right? But here are performance analysis uh, tools to the rescue, like Scalaska or Vampire, for instance. And, and these are tools we will learn in lecture eight, where you will learn also a little bit to think about the bigger picture about communication, which performance problem there is and where in the problem it is actually and where in the system of the HPC mapping to the real HPC resource it actually is. Or is it an MPI problem and communication of programming it wrongly, which we can detect with Vampire? Just saying that if you scale up, um, you will not have any more the big picture directly as a human you have to admit to this. You have to have automated analysis. You have to basically think about each of the different cores of this 500,000 cores we said, what they are doing, what communication they're doing. Are there some load imbalance problems? Are there some, let's say, performance problems like a, a late sender and, and things like that, what we will learn in lecture eight. Just giving you an, a pointer that, of course, in hate performance computer, we scale up very high. And, and with this, always strive, you know, thinking about strong scaling, weak scaling. But in the end, you need automated tools to help you to achieve that high scalings. Because as a human, you would compute things in a way that without tools, you probably think of a very straightforward way, but forgot a bit about Amdahl's law, maybe, and so on. So chopping up the domain into the same equal sizes all the time will not make sense in some certain spaces. And, and and so on. You have to always think about what happens if you scale up from two cores, four cores, up to 256, 1,024, or even half a million, of course. There's a big difference in it, and these systems help you detecting it. And in a way, that's really all I wanted to leave you on the table as a motivation, really, for parallelization, for understanding some of the key terms like speed up, Amdahl's law, Gustafsson's law, strong scaling, weak scaling. If you are in the world of HPC, you need to know these terms and what they entail. Um, they're all basically complementing each other. They, they have a certain relationship, but to really know these relationships is very important. Then again, thinking about this domain decomposition and this very, you know, maybe perhaps sometimes a bit abstract way of thinking of, you know, how you shop down a domain into different pieces. Let us review a little bit in a domain of basically here manufacturing, where this actually can make sense to understand the stress of materials in order to create them. You basically first build them in a computer. You know exactly the material ingredients, their physical properties. You can compute this over time. And I hope 
this was already giving you some in, uh, some good pointer to this time notion, which is very important in HPC. Now, meta it's AI, where you learn in different epochs and batches, um, or you basically do here simulations of, you know, basically uh, physical laws with numerical methods over time. It doesn't really matter in the end. That's what we do in HPC um, to, to really have a real simulation. So let's go to the video a little bit because it captures the essence of this very nicely um, in different manufacturing um, use cases. So short disclaimer again, I'm not really funded by this company or the producer of this video, but I think it shows you a, a nice view of really different manufacturing properties of the domain decomposition you see here. Um, the less domain decomposition here, but here a very accurate domain decomposition where you assume the stress of this material by putting them together here at these different pieces will be most of interest, so you have a domain decomposition to maybe compute that a little bit more. Just giving you an, another example that the world is not always very flat, very Cartesian, very nicely choppy in two grids. Of course, we have the different ideas of how to do domain decomposition, uh, basically, and this is something what we also will learn in different parts in the next lectures. So I encourage you to stay on board and see you next time.